All right, we are good to go. Um, so welcome everyone to the May monthly meeting. Tonight we are going to be having uh, two, we have two things to do on our agenda. The first thing is having our annual election. Um, and the second one is having a fantastic presentation from Rod Hughes on his personal observatory. Um, Dom, was there anything that you wanted to talk about uh, prior to the actual election or? Um, I didn't have anything on in my mind. Um, we've been having some really good weather. If anybody, you know, we've got a local dark sky observing site. If anybody wants information about it, uh, send me an email. Um, I suppose most people here have my email, but I'll put it in the chat anyway. So uh, send me an email, or if you're not getting the newsletter, uh, let me know, and I will uh, I will send you one. But I can also send you the link to su to subscribe yourself because that's the real way to, to to join. Is is you need to click a link and and send an email, and then it will process your your email. It looks at the return address and puts that in the list, and then you'll start getting the uh, the newsletters and other emails and things like that. Thank you, Don. About yeah. it. I didn't really have anything else to, to say, really. Um, do any of the other board members have anything that are present here tonight? Jeff, I know I know from from John that you were up working today. Oh, you're muted. Yeah, that's correct. Um, I don't know if everybody's had a chance <clears throat> to see the latest two videos on our YouTube channel. We uh, we have a playlist, so we've been working on the Swanson 21 inch, trying to upgrade it with uh, modern equipment to basically turn it turn it into a, a very nice robot and we finally this past weekend uh, remounted the the assembly back up on the pier so you can see that in in video number 12 of the series it's the latest there are only i mean there are 12 of them out there um, so it was it was good progress uh, mimo DiMartino, uh, Tom Darrington, and myself were working this weekend. Now that we're, we're all vaccinated and, you know, a good month or more past vaccination, we're much more comfortable working in threes rather than twos, and uh, things went quite well. Um, we've got a few little minor mechanical things to finish up, but we're also moving forward with uh, wiring and you know cabling and getting things connected. Now one of the things you'll see on the video is that we uh, have not mounted the OTA but and rather than mount the OTA directly what we've done is built a kind of a, a wooden structure that we can put counterweights into and we've mounted that wooden structure. It's just a block and so it represents the mass of the OTA. And as we start um, testing, you know, these are extremely powerful motors and we don't want them to suddenly take off and drive the, the delicate optics into the floor or into the pier or something like that. So we're gonna be doing testing with this dummy mass that's uh, it's a fairly well balanced right now, I'd say it's, you know, somewhere within three pounds um, at the, you know, at three feet out. So, foot pound. So, um, so Jeff, it doesn't just simulate the mass, it simulates the mass distribution as well. Is that what you're saying? Uh, not completely. It's, it's not an inertia simulator. It's a mass. Okay. It just balances. Okay. All right. You know, because otherwise we would be extremely imbalanced right. with nothing on it. Right. Um, but no, it doesn't match the moment no. of inertia. No, but and we don't need we don't need to really for the type of testing we need to do. But yeah, we've been very pleased with the progress, and I encourage you to go take a look at the videos on the YouTube channel just search for vbas on youtube if you search for von brown astronomical society you get von brown everything <laughs> yeah we have the links in the newsletter too yeah right yeah 
that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Um, does anybody else, uh, Eric or Frank or uh, um, where did uh, and Chris, do you have anything? I'll just say, Treasurer, we had we did pass the budget uh, from last meeting, so we we do have our budget. Our budgetary year goes from July to uh, end of June. So we're approaching the end of this year. Of course, we've had the COVID impacts that have, you know, zeroed out almost our income for planetarium and, you know, gift shop. Uh, still have the membership dues coming in. So we've greatly reduced the amount of expenditures in this past year. Obviously, no speaker fees or anything like that. Uh, pizza <laughs> zeroed out um, for most of the year. <clears throat> So uh, we actually didn't do too badly with some of the donations we got and everything. We were only, uh, you know, a small, maybe four or five thousand less in the bank than we had the previous year. So this year, to be conservative, we uh, did a budget with uh, a much lower anticipated revenue and a much lower anticipated rate of expenditure. So we're trying to be conservative to make sure that we don't. Uh, eat into our nest egg in the bank. We still have over $50,000 in the bank. So we've got enough for operating costs and um, any contingencies, you know, if, if a major <clears throat> item were a mechanical item like uh, our, you know, HVAC or anything went down, we, we can uh, deal with those kinds of issues. So, so we're on pretty sound footing. Uh, we hope that this year will be a much better year than we, you know, have budgeted for, and, and that'll put us in the in the black. So that's it. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Eric. Uh, Frank, Chris, did you have anything? No, I don't. Thanks, Michael. Okay. Cool. So we're going to go ahead and begin with the elections tonight. So the positions that are up for election tonight are going to be the vice president, treasurer, director of education, director of facilities, and the student director. Now, all of these positions are currently filled by only one candidate, and we can take uh, nominations from the floor if somebody would like to run for one of these positions. So we will be going through one by one. I have a feeling that that probably won't be the case, but you never know. So I'm going to do it right. So is there currently anybody interested in running for the vice president position? I guess you'd have to nominate yourself. So I, I take that as a... As <laughs> well, a we've already... There's already he's, an incumbent. Yeah, he's already on the, I'm, We're already uh, in a nominee. I'm talking about... Uh, you have to open it up once on the floor as well. Yeah. Just, well, so, clear, Mike, just say hey, you're the incumbent and you have agreed to nominate and committee. Yes, I have, I have agreed to, to serve another uh, term. Yes. So everybody knows. Technically my first, hey, but yes. Hey, Michael, let's let's we can speed this up by saying, does anybody want to nominate themselves or another person for any of these offices? Sure. Okay. And that's the answer. Apparently not. So let's let's just have the election and uh, and get on with the speaker. I don't think there's any reason to be overly formal about this. Well, I just like to do things okay. by the book. That's just okay. how I am. I'm sorry. Um, okay. So just going once, going twice. Anybody have any objections to that whatsoever? Yes, no, maybe so. Okay, cool. So currently our roster, or our actually it's the slate, is uh, me, Michael Buford, as the vice president. Uh, Eric Sokowski as the treasurer, Jenna Crook as the director of education, Frank Schenk as the director of facilities, and student director Logan Curtis. Uh, so all of these people have already agreed to, uh, to these terms. Um, as the bylaws state, we can go ahead and go for a voice, uh, voice uh, vote affirmation. So all those in favor of the candidates, uh, please say aye. 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 Wave at the camera. Aye. Wave at the camera, Aye. whatever. Hi. Yeah, members only, by the way. Yeah. If you're not what a is, member, please do not vote. Is anybody anybody opposed? Okay, so we're Ta -da. We, we did it. It was so hard. Okay. So now we're gonna get to the fun part. So tonight we're having Rod Hughes is going to be giving a presentation on his personally constructed observatory. 
absolutely, I'm super excited to see this one. Um, Rado is going to be going over his dome, the astrophotography gear that he uses, the construction, and the operation of the observatory. So make sure that you take notes if you're interested in this kind of thing, if you're wanting to build your own. Rod is the person to ask. And at this point, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Rod. Thank you, Michael. Let me get my screen set up here. I've got to do this twice. Then I'm going to start the slideshow. And then I have to stop the share and pick up the main screen. So you should see just one slide at this point. Uh, Michael said, my name is Rod Hughes and uh, I have built an observatory and I call it Sand Island Observatory. Uh, so I'm gonna start off with a little bit of an introduction by myself and I'm gonna add a little bit. Astronomy is a journey and I have been on a journey for several years uh, into astronomy. So I've kind of embellished the program tonight was just a little bit about me and kind of how I got here. Uh, I've been married for 50 years and we celebrated our anniversary this year. I have uh, two children and two grandchildren. Uh, the majority of my working career was in uh, broadcast engineering, everything from radio, uh, mostly into television, some consulting along the way. And I was the chief engineer at WAFF-TV for many years. That was until I had to make a decision to relocate or make a career change. Uh, one thing that happens in, uh, in the broadcast world, you move around a little bit uh, with different opportunities. Uh, Huntsville is a unique city to, uh, to live in. There's a lot of opportunities for uh, engineering type. So I decided to uh, take some computer courses at UAH, spent several years writing and testing computer programs uh, in, uh, in Huntsville. I like to, uh, I basically enjoy a hands-on approach for integrating systems. I uh, like to do design, construction, test, and operation. But to be honest, I, I do have a confession to make. Uh, this may not come as a surprise to some of you, but uh, when I was, I was a young teenager living in Iowa, and uh, I'd watch meteor showers in the summer, and that's really where I got introduced to astronomy. So 45 years later, uh, I have a serious astronomy addiction problem. So anyone that has an addiction, uh, you really need to answer this question. Are you ready to leave your addiction behind? Well, no, I guess I'm not. So uh, around 2012, uh, I joined VBAS, went to some meetings and uh, pondered more things about uh, my addiction so guess what happens after you do that? Well, you have to buy some equipment. And so I bought a, uh, a party, I think it was a year later, I bought a, an eight inch Mead telescope. Uh, the LX80 mount in the picture uh, turned out to be a mistake. Uh, so guess what you do when you have made a mistake? You buy some more equipment. So I bought a Celestron CGM DX mount and I spent uh, many evenings at the old airport in South Huntsville learning more about the equipment how to set it up and you know you do a trial and error and, until you get it right. A few years later uh, it's uh, retirement time is approaching and uh, I hope you all get a chance to retire. Uh, I've been retired for four years and I've enjoyed every single minute of it. So uh, since I have an addiction, uh, I needed to do something about it. And that meant uh, relocating, uh, leaving Huntsville and uh, finding a place uh, where some dark skies. Uh, my wife is my best friend. And we started uh, spending many hours uh, talking about what each one of us wanted to do about a retirement. It wasn't just about me. 
Uh, we visited many, many places, uh, trying to figure out what we wanted to do after we both retired. And uh, we decided to leave the big city. And we picked this location here in, in Alabama, South Alabama. Uh, this is the Miller's Ferry Lock and Dam. And uh, we fell in love with a place out here that kind of met both of the objectives that we were looking for. Uh, hope you can see my cursor. I don't know if you can, but this is the little island out here. And this is, uh, this is where I live right now. And uh, the picture is oriented to the north. So for the most part, when I'm looking south, there's a couple lights here on the dam, but they're, uh, they don't really create much of a sky dome. But uh, this part of the, uh, the Alabama River is uh, known for uh, crappie fishing. Uh, a lot of people like to hunt and fish down here. Uh, so we bought a place uh, here in Miller's Ferry 18 months before we retired in 2017. And I've got to tell you, life in Miller's Ferry is very quiet. It's peaceful. Uh, we have many friendly neighbors. Uh, a lot of people out here are retired. Some are not. They use this area as a vacation home. So uh, Miller's Ferry, uh, we don't have a red light. We don't have a grocery store. We don't have a gas station. And we used to have a US post office, but that's been, that's long gone away. Uh, Camden is the, uh, is the closest city, it's 10 miles away. Walmart, 45 miles away. So when I shop, I, uh, I like to shop at two places. One is Amazon. And the other place is OPT. So you got to get your uh, addiction filled with getting some equipment. So generally, people out here in Miller's Ferry, they love to hunt, they love to fish, but uh, not for me. I, I enjoy doing astronomy out here. The skies are pretty dark. It's almost, and I really mean almost, Bortle Two skies. If, if I had picked a place a little bit farther north, it would have been Bortle Two, but uh, right where at where we're living, uh, it's almost Bortle too. Still dark. So uh, Miller's Ferries in Wilcox County and uh, that alligator, that's a big one. It's the largest one ever caught in Alabama and it's on display. Uh, it's a beast. Uh, but unfortunately, Wilcox County is also known for the poorest county in Alabama and uh, I don't know if you knew this, but our governor, Kay Ivey, uh, she's from Camden. So as I started uh, thinking about what I'm gonna do in astronomy, I came up with a lot of questions uh, as part of my journey. And so why do I need an observatory? Well, the biggest reason is time management. Uh, you're all probably familiar with uh, driving to some location, setting up your equipment, calibrating it. Okay, now you get to use it for a little bit. You take it down and then you go home and then you do it all over tomorrow. I, I guess that's good for learning how your equipment works. But after a while, that, that part of it gets, gets a little bit tiring. But you do what you, do what you gotta do. So nearing retirement, it, it just made good sense to, uh, to come up with an observatory there's another reason which uh, my wife was more concerned about, and that is personal safety. Um, my wife has a, an active imagination, so she thinks there's there's bears out there and other wild animals that are you know going to attack me, or you know someone's going to hit me over the head. So she's she was concerned about personal safety, and it was her. Uh, encouragement to actually build an observatory in the backyard. So uh, uh, thank you, dear. I, I, I appreciate it. I do love my observatory. Another question, how are you going to use your observatory? Well, there's visual astronomy, which I would probably most of us start off with visual astronomy. Uh, I was very interested in astrophotography. And uh, there's also spectro spectroscopy photometry, how about tracking asteroids, planetary astronomy, 
solar astronomy, radio astronomy. So, and there's many, many more things. That's one thing I love about astronomy. There's a lot of opportunities to do different things in astronomy. And uh, it's, it's very interesting. Well, who's gonna use it? Well, for my case, it's just gonna be an individual, but you know, there might be a club um, or you could have it open to the public and, and invite people out. Uh, of course, who's gonna build it? Uh, that's gonna be me. Uh, I did get some help from family and friends. Well, some friends, uh, I, mostly just family, but, um, and who's gonna maintain it? Well, that's gonna have to be me too. So these are all things you have to consider um, when you're gonna build an observatory. And then there's uh, some limitations. I don't think there's many limitations in this picture. Uh, certainly my limitation would be uh, having a location like that. But there's always uh, things to consider, light pollution. Is it easy or difficult to get to your site? Weather considerations is always something. And then of course, location, location, location. Are there any local ordinances that need to be considered? So what are you going to need at the observatory? Um, all these things have to be thought up. Probably don't need that much power, but you are gonna need some. And of course the internet is uh, extremely useful. Um, of course you have waste management things to be concerned about and you want your observatory to be stable. Wi-Fi would be nice to have, but not absolutely necessary. And probably the hardest thing to think about is uh, what, are, what will the future bring? What, what do you want or think you might want to do in the future? Will your observatory be able to handle that? So I wound up doing a lot of research, looking at a lot of things. Uh, the internet is, is, a, is a good resource to, uh, to use and learn about different parts of, of your observatory. And along the way, you will have to make some type of compromise. Either you're gonna to have to uh, you know, give up some dark skies for a better location or vice versa, or you know, maybe there's certain parts of the world you don't wanna live in. Uh, in my case, uh, more of my compromise was where we're going to live because my wife likes a lot of social interaction and uh, Miller's Ferry has, I think about 250 homes out here. So we've got some neighbors that she can interact with. And uh, that was something very important to her. And she also wanted to be near the water. So um, Miller's Ferry worked out, worked out well for us. If it's possible, develop a long-term plan, things you might want to uh, uh, do for the future. And uh, you need to come up with some idea of what you're willing to tolerate. Um, maybe it's insects, pests, uh, dust, uh, salt water, uh, you know, different things that you're willing to accept along the way with your observatory. Uh, how about snow? Um, I used to live in Iowa, Wisconsin. I've had all the snow I want. So um, I enjoy living in the South. I uh, mentioned earlier, pest control is always a concern. Uh, we have little brown ants uh, looking for water all the time. So uh, as long as you control the ants, they're, they're not much of a problem. And you wanna think about how long you intend to keep your observatory, whether it's going to be short-term or long-term. Probably the most important thing is to make sure you enjoy your journey uh, in astronomy, wherever it takes you, whether uh, whatever you enjoy doing, that's it's really important. Finally, I had to ask myself, is, it, is an observatory practical for me? I, I came up with the answer, of course, yes, it was. And um, there's always a cost involved um, and uh, you need to find out if you can afford it or not. Now it's time to find a place to put your observatory since you've decided you, you want to have one. Um, this is uh, from darksitefinder.com. And uh, this is the, uh, the Alabama River. And this area in green is the lock and dam at Miller's Ferry. And uh, you can see about where, where I'm living. Uh, 
the street's called Sand Island Drive, so I just thought, well, we'll call it Sand Island Observatory. You want to make sure Polaris is visible, and uh, it is from my location. What does your horizon look like? Are there, is there going to be some concerns with uh, trees or, or other obstacles? Um, as I look north between these, actually just on the other side of this tree, so um, I had to pick my location where I was going to actually build the observatory. So I always had a clear view of Polaris. What about your neighbors? Uh, are they going to build a high rise or build something else that's going to affect? Uh, this is actually my house. And this little dot here uh, is where the observatory is. Um, I don't know how often they take these satellite images, but uh, it's, it's fairly accurate. And uh, this area to the east is uh, miles and miles of uh, just woods. There's no real construction going on out there. We've got some nice friendly neighbors. Um, in fact, uh, this neighbor here to the north uh, recently bought this house. And there's little light here that he uses for, uh, for his backyards. And he told me if, uh, if that light is ever on and it's bothering you, he said, just go over and turn it off. So uh, they're, uh, Neighbors are very friendly out here. We work together. You might want to check out the sky at night, make sure it's uh, as dark as you think it is. And uh, we did mention uh, weather. Uh, it's a good idea to have a little weather station with your observatory so you kind of know what's, uh, what's going on, what the temperature, what the humidity, what your pressure is. So anytime you build something, there's going to be some risk along the way. Um, and sometimes risk is unknown, but if you do enough research, uh, you might have a good idea of, uh, of what your risks might be. Let's pick an observatory. What kind of an observatory do you want? A lot of choices out there. There's a roll-off roof. Uh, that's common. A lot of people build a roll-off. How about a roll-away building? Uh, that's an interesting approach, too. There's the half dome, a clam shell. I didn't realize it, but there's a portable tent. Um, I've never seen this. Uh, they say the dome rotates. Uh, interesting, probably wouldn't hold up well in tents, but it, man, it sure would be good for uh, parties, wouldn't it? How about a mobile observatory? Uh, that'd be pretty cool to, uh, to take with you in camping. And of course, then there's a the full dome, which, uh, which I decided to go with. I found this slide on the internet, which, uh, which is very interesting. And let me just say this, this first uh, bullet here on preventing dew. I do not have dew problem in South Alabama. Um, it, if nothing else, that dome was worth it just to eliminate all the moisture uh, that accumulates on your equipment at night. Uh, and of course, it blocks stray light and, and other features, but um, if you can go that route, I don't think you'd be disappointed. I was a little concerned since I was always used to be able to look up and see the whole sky at one time. Uh, if I was going to lose, uh, lose that with a full dome, and the answer really is, is no. I mean, you can always stick your head outside, and if you need to look up at the sky and look for something, but uh, generally speaking, uh, it's, it's not a problem. And of course, uh, remote control. Uh, don't laugh, but you can use a PlayStation controller to control your observatory if you so choose. Uh, not necessarily recommended, but you, know, you, can, you can do it if you wanted to. So you've picked an observatory. Uh, it's time to have a plan what you're where how you're going to build it where you're going to build it so i prepared a uh, a property drawing and uh let's see i got some things in the way here now you can see i decided to put the observatory right here and this is a little garden patio thing my wife wanted uh, she didn't want to look back at all of my buildings and stuff so 
uh, we built that for her. And this is a small cottage. I had intended to do remote control here, and I can still do that. But for the most part, uh, I like to, I just like to stay in the observatory uh, when I'm doing things and do some remote control, but, but certainly not all the time. This is the drawing I came up with for my pier. It amounts to, I believe, four tons of concrete. Most of it's at the bottom here. So it it's, uh, has a lot of mass to it. And uh, the pier plate is up here at the top. I can grab one of these three bolts that the pier plate is attached to and actually swing on it while I'm observing. And, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't affect the... Uh, the, the scope at all. It's, it's, there's so much mass in the ground there. Um, I guess if you started banging on the concrete, it might create some high frequency uh, vibrations, but uh, having a lot of mass, um, you know, it's never had a problem with it. Also decided to, uh, uh, I have a raised uh, platform in the observatory and this octagon shape is the area that's open actually inside of the dome. And there's approximately 14 to 16 inches on each side of the, uh, of the walls. And I have built some workbenches in this area. And uh, I came up with some steps and there's a trap door over here. This door faces pretty much to the south and uh, so my operating point is basically looking north. Uh, the scope is going to be pointed most of the time, you know, south, east, or west. So if I'm sitting here, I'm always behind the, uh, the, the scope. And uh, the computer monitors that are here, they're shining light away from the aperture of the scope. So I thought that was uh, a good thing to consider. Um, oh, I forgot I had this slide. So it shows where north is. And the red circle is where I operate from. So I've got a plan. I've got an observatory. It's uh, time to get started. Always be uh, concerned about safety. We don't want anyone to get hurt. One of the downsides of my uh, location were these trees. Um, they're tall. So we hired a professional to come in and remove the trees. They, uh, we had two, these two large pine trees in the front yard. They brought in a bucket truck and man, these guys went to town. They, they, uh, they got her done in short order. They brought in these large dump trucks and they had everything they needed to, uh, to gather everything. By the time that day was over, I had, uh, I think it was four large pine trees cut down, removed, uh, all the stumps were, uh, were stumped out. The lawn was, uh, was put back into shape, all done professionally in one day. And uh, it just, it was fantastic. And this, this one tree back here, this is actually on the neighbor's uh, yard. And uh, I talked to him. We actually removed that tree, but I talked to him ahead of time. Uh, he was okay with uh, removing that tree. All of our neighbors in here have a structure like this. This is a deer stand for, uh, for cleaning, your, uh, cleaning your deer. Uh, of course, I don't have one. I don't hunt and fish, but I do fish, but uh, I don't hunt. So this is the backyard. Uh, decided to uh, uh, put, the, uh, put the pier here. I don't know if you can see that orange bucket or not, but that's where we decided to uh, mark the location of our pier. And you can see the sun's coming up here to the east. Time to get ready and dig a hole. Uh, that's my wife. Um, she wanted to help me as much as she could. So uh, we started March 16, 2016. I'm still working in Huntsville, but uh, we'd come down here every weekend and uh, begin 2016 started working on, on, the, uh, on the observatory pier. Uh, that's the size of the foundation, pretty much uh, 41 by 41 by 24. And we put some gravel in the bottom of it. 
Uh, Ruth was glad that was done. Uh, so was I. So since we leave for the for the week to go back to work, we you know cover up the hole. And then we started preparing the rebar for the concrete for the uh, for the pier. And welded that up together. And there's the upper extension. This is looks pretty tall, but you know a lot of this is going to go into the ground. And then it's time to mix concrete. Uh, we April sixteenth, I think that was a Saturday, but we spent all day long mixing concrete just to fill up this hole and uh, took a lot of concrete. We, we were glad that day was done, but uh, I think we had, we had two pallets of uh, concrete, those are 80 pound bags. That's a lot of concrete, glad that's done. But uh, we filled it up. We used uh, 18 inch uh, diameter sono tube uh, as we did 18 inch and then we put a 12 inch on the top here. And by the way, I do have some 18 inch sono tube left. I don't know if anybody could use some, but I have, uh, you know, you can't buy just a four foot piece. You had to think you had to buy like a 12 foot piece or something. But if anybody's interested and they'd like to like to some sono tube 18 inch, I have some. You're welcome. Uh, you're welcome to it. Braced it all up, filled her up with concrete and um, we had to pour this in uh, in stages, so it was not one continuous pour, but it has not affected the uh, integrity of the uh, of the pier. And this is a picture. This is the upper pier, and it's a 12 inch sono tube. It was a little difficult getting concrete up here, so what we wound up using was a uh, two quart iced tea uh, container, and we. We'd get up on a step ladder and we'd hand uh, two quarts of concrete at a time. Took us a while, but we filled it up and uh, got it done. So uh, I guess it's about one month later, we had the pier was uh, finished and uh, we're making progress. Uh, May 6th, the uh, dome arrived. Uh, the neighbors were kind of curious what I was doing. They you know, see something like that come across a flatbed trailer. They weren't sure what I was doing at the time, but uh, brought about a lot of curiosity. And we started preparing the, uh, the pad. In the I did cut a notch out in the pad. I was going to run uh, plastic uh, con pipe from uh, this wall and then up the side to uh, get uh, electrical wires and so forth up the pier. Uh, actually, uh, cutting concrete is a bit messy, and uh, there we're, we're getting ready for uh, for more concrete. Uh, added some gravel to it. I, here on the back side, you can actually see I have the plastic conduit in place. I actually abandoned that approach, and the uh, the floors is about, is, I guess it's about this level right about here. So I decided just to run a, a trough uh, at the floor level from the sidewall uh, to the uh, through the pier uh, to run cables from the outside. Put down some rebar, let's see here. So we had help uh, after we spent all day in April pouring the foundation uh, we solicited family to come down and uh, we've got more concrete and see a couple of pallets there. Uh, that's my son and uh, he, he was a big help. And my grandson was there to, to help out as well. My grandson, uh, Caleb, he, uh, he carried all of the concrete. My other grandson wasn't able to be there but uh, he was uh, in charge of moving concrete that day, bit by bit. And then uh, Ruth and I, we'd, we'd work on leveling it and getting it flat. More concrete. We're almost done. And we finished up the, uh, the pad. Uh, 
So uh, a few days later, we started uh, assembling the frame. When I ordered the, uh, the observatory, normally these walls are four feet, but I wanted a full height door. And so I, I talked to Explorer Dome and uh, they were able to, uh, to prefab these walls. It's uh, I think two inch square tubing, or maybe it's inch and three quarter. So they uh, prefabbed uh, the four walls out of aluminum tubing and I went with six foot. This top structure uh, is going to support the dome and uh, it's bolted together on the ground and they just, just lift it up and, and put on top. We made sure the, uh, the walls were square with the frame. There it's in place. Then we checked to make sure everything was, was what it was supposed to be. And we bolted everything together at that point. Uh, there's a six foot door and the walls are just plain metal. These, these come in flat uh, metal panels and get around the, excuse me, to get around the corner, you actually have to bend those panels. That was kind of the hardest part to do. Uh, to bend uh, that uh, steel panel to go around the corners. And we set up a couple of saw horses and some two by fours and just leaned on the panel where it needed to bend and get the metal to, uh, to uh, make the shape that it needed to be. And you can see here that the panels is just curved right around the corner. Uh, you can get it done. It's just, it just wasn't, uh, wasn't that easy, but, but it worked. And we're almost done by the end of June. So this would be the back wall uh, looking to the north. So there we, we have it done. Uh, this upper ring is what the dome is going to slide on. And uh, my son-in-law came down and he's gonna help uh, get the dome in place. This is uh, end of July. So this looks a little scary, but uh, probably the, our biggest challenge is how are we gonna get that? I don't know how heavy that dome is. Maybe it's 300 pounds, something like that. How are we gonna get that dome up seven feet in the air, um, you know, without dropping it or hurting someone's back? So we came up with this, uh, this ramp and uh, it looks, um, it worked. Let's just say it worked. So we tried to engineer it the best we could. We got a two inch pipe supported in the center and the boards have got clamps on it so it can't go anywhere. And we tie these four, four, a four foot posts around the, uh, the observatory. And uh, this is a picture of the side view. I know it looks bad. Um, and it's what we had to use, I guess. Uh, anyway, we have a, a, uh, a cable going up here back to a Jeep that is going to lift everything up in place. And there you can see the Jeep in the background. So we raised the lamp, we tested it, and then we had to do a, uh, had to do a dummy test. And uh, guess who was the dummy? That was me. So we got the, the ring is the first piece. This, the dome will set on the ring and the ring will set on the support. So we have everything uh, ready to go. So the dome is, it, there's a little bit of sagging here. We knew it was um, going to have. We hear stuff. it, but we don't see it. Oh, you don't see it. Yeah, it's completely black there, Rod. Well, my apologies. Um, I can see it here. It looks great. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't know what I can do. Um, let me just go on to the next slide. We can see if we can fix it later. Yeah. Um, we put supports after we rose raised the dome into position. We put some supports underneath it 
just to make sure that the support structure wasn't going to uh, give way. Uh, certainly there's not a lot of dynamic stress uh, on the structures, pretty much just static, uh, but we did put some supports underneath there. So we were happy we got it all up, got it up in the air and nobody got hurt. This is a picture of the support ring. I don't know if you can see, there's a couple holes here and then there's a hole here. Uh, this is uh, where we would attach skateboard wheels and the dome is gonna rotate on these skateboard wheels. I have some pictures of that in just a second. And this is the, the ring that rests on the support. And you can see there's a bunch of holes here. And this is what, this is the drive mechanism or the drive ring uh, for uh, azimuth rotation. And so we're gonna slide the dome in position. And this next slide shows the uh, skateboard wheels. And you, so this is, keeps the dome from coming off the track and then the vertical one holds it from, uh, so it can roll on the skateboard. It works out real good. This next picture shows the uh, drive motor for azimuth. And it's just a plastic uh, cog that engages the, uh, the holes. The upper slot has, a, there's a drive motor. The drive motors operate off 12 volts DC and you just reverse polarity uh, to move clockwise or counterclockwise. And this is the lower slot motor. Of course, you have to open up the upper slot before you do the lower slot. The, uh, the two slots overlap each other. I did have a problem uh, with the way the, uh, they had engineered the control mechanism for the slots. Since you're just reversing the voltage to, uh, to open and close the slots, uh, they, it, the, uh, the system came with a wireless controller. And if you operated the wireless controller too quick, you could tell the slot to move both directions briefly. Well, that puts a heavy stress on the battery. And of course the fuse is gonna blow. So uh, I re-engineered the uh, wiring so that we could interlock the relays. So you, could, you couldn't move but one direction at a time, even though you gave both commands. Fine, go. Now, can you see this video? No, I cannot. Okay, I'm just gonna skip it. Um, it, it just shows uh, after we, it just showed us rotating the dome in place after we had gotten it uh, in position. Uh, again, my apologies on the video. Um, so uh, end of July, we have everything assembled. Uh, we started in March um, and we finished it by July. And uh, it was a lot of work, but it was uh, well worth it. Uh, we also ordered a, a garage and pre-built and, uh, and a cottage that arrived in September. And uh, there they put the cottage beside the uh, observatory. I was a little concerned that the peak of the, uh, of the cottage was going to impact the observatory looking to the east. But since everything rises from the east, I wasn't really overly concerned uh, with that. Um, I just have to wait for the, uh, the objects to rise a little bit. And, and so that's why I went with that uh, orientation. And I put the uh, garage uh, adjacent to the shop um, on the other side. I don't have many pictures of the floor construction, um, but we did put some uh, two by eights in there. And there's the right side. This is the side that'll have the, uh, the trap and the steps going to it. And the left side, uh, we hand dug a trench for, uh, for electrical power. Uh, that ran to the cottage, and then we'd uh, run the internet uh, in the uh, PVC. Uh, and this is the connection going in. What we did is we run power and internet. Uh, well, not we had power into the cottage, and we ran internet up to a junction box, and then we would take power and internet back from the cottage and run it over to the observatory. And this is our, our final configuration. Actually, I took this picture last year. 
uh, we put up this wall. On the other side of this wall is the uh, garden patio for my wife. And then she doesn't have to look at all this stuff here in the back. We've added uh, electronic lock uh, to the door. So uh, it's, always, it's always under lock. Um, and this is what it looks like with the door open. You can see the trap, the trap door here. And just open that up and the steps are, steps are illuminated. Inside the trap door is closed and you can see the beginning of the uh, workspace on the left hand side. And oops, something's missing there, my fault. Uh, there's the, uh, the other side uh, showing the uh, workspace. And the operating point, you can see the keyboard here on the right hand side is, is the operating point. I think that's the slide that for some reason is missing. Uh, my current configuration, the mount is a uh, 10 micron uh, GM 1000 HPS mount. It has optical encoders in it. Excuse me just a minute. I need it. Throat's getting dry. I like this uh, mount a lot. It has electronic uh, balancing assist where you can uh, balance your OTA within 0.1%, uh, which is, is really nice. Everything is smooth and, you know, having optical encoders, um, I can just turn that thing and I'm running and once you're polar line, you're just ready to go every night. Really nice. Uh, this is the controller for it. Uh, the controller is, is, uh, runs Linux. And the keypad. Uh, I'm using an 11 inch uh, Celestron Edge as the uh, primary scope. And I have a um, QSI 683 uh, camera on the back end and a camera rotator. Uh, the Edge HD, you can, you can add a hyperstar to it so you can uh, run the scope at F2. I also have a green laser pointer uh, built into it. Um, it's a lot easier using the laser pointer to, to at least do your initial alignment. Uh, I added a power distribution panel um, for uh, camera and auxiliary circuits. The uh, guides, and uh, this mess here, I have a uh, ASI 290 uh, guide scope uh, on a note on a uh, off axis uh, guider. And I also added a two inch filter drawer, uh, which is handy to have to pop filters in and out. Um, I've uh, started doing uh, spectroscopy, so it's, it's easier just to pop in a filter right here. And uh, I have uh, ASI 183 MC, a one-shot color camera. I also have a uh, 183 uh, monochrome camera and filter wheel that I can uh, substitute here if I want. Everything runs off a 12-volt battery, which is nice. And on the peer column, I have switches for, uh, for controlling all of the... Um, controlling the power. All of this has to be manually operated. Uh, the mount requires a 24 volt DC circuit. And so I've got a little DC to DC converter that converts 12 volts to 24 volts. And um, so I can monitor 24 volts up here and 12 volts out here. There's a few times where I've been running and for whatever reason, the battery charger didn't get turned on. It, supposed to be turned on automatically by home automation. Um, but um, if that battery charger is not on, uh, the system can, uh, can drain the battery pretty quick. Uh, I'm using an luminescent uh, flat panel. Uh, this is a 550 millimeter. And uh, I put it on a, a roll around table and I just point the uh, OTA down towards the floor uh, to do all the flats. I do have some, uh, some cool lighting options. When you have people over, they like to see the cool lights, right? 
So I can, uh, I've got red lights underneath uh, the uh, dome going all the way around. And then I can turn white lights on here. So it gives you kind of a cool look. Uh, Rod, we have a question here from George yes. Smythe. He asks about the green laser pointer being a hazard to pilots. Is that an issue around in your area? Yes, it's an issue around any area. And uh, before I turn that thing on, I check the skies out to make sure I'm not, you know, seeing any uh, pilots going on out there. So, yeah, that is an issue. Thank you. Mm hmm um, of course, I can turn the lights off and just have, this is the operating point, and um, can, uh, can minimize the light. There's actually two computer monitors on this back, but I have some black cloth that I can throw up over them to, uh, to uh, dim them as well. I have a sky quality meter, and uh, these readings, I don't know if you can read them, but they're right around 21 and a half which is getting real close to, uh, to Bortle II skies. So I've learned a lot of lessons along the way. And uh, I thought this was an interesting picture, but you know, you'd wanna do things like check for water leaks when you're doing your construction. Uh, you wanna also make sure you don't burn out while you're doing all of this building and construction. So it's a good idea to balance your life with some other activities. The whole idea here is to enjoy the, enjoy the journey. Uh, there can be some unexpected problems that come and you just have to deal with them as they happen. I don't know if you've heard of O'Toole's corollary to Murphy's law, but O'Toole said uh, Murphy was an optimist. So if you're frustrated when you're working, just, I just, I'll just stop and go do something else. It's, it's better to just stop, come back later uh, when you have more energy or maybe you're not tired. Uh, again, enjoy the journey. Uh, I found out that the dome azimuth control was really a luxury. It's really not needed that much for local operation. Uh, depending upon if, you're, if your OTA is looking towards the horizon or towards the zenith, uh, you, know, you might ha have to adjust that dome for you know, upwards to 20 minutes before you need to actually move the dome a little bit. So uh, I opted not to uh, actually have a remote control for azimuth. Uh, I'll just manually turn it. It's not a problem. And I uh, <clears throat> mentioned earlier that do is not a problem. That is really nice. Uh, it can be up and running in about five minutes. And uh, unless it's super cold at night, uh, I pretty much enjoy being in the observatory. I have added a, a 12 volt uh, uh, jacket uh, that I can put on and keeps my keep my body warm, and uh, that you know at least takes some of the uh, being out in sub-zero weather. Uh, it does get freezing cold down here. Uh, it's just not that that often. Uh, it's important to not take shortcuts. Uh, you know, if you take a shortcut, you'll eventually pay for it later someplace. Uh, work with your neighbors to control light pollution. And um, I, I do have some white work lights inside the dome. So, you know, if you need, need it, it's available. Uh, I've added black tape over offending LED lights. Uh, so you can keep it super dark in there when you need to. And I used a home automation uh, for controlling the electrical outlets and so forth. Uh, I took a uh, regular desk chair. I put better wheels on it that'll roll better on wood. And I took the armrests off so I can roll around uh, the pier whenever I need to. Uh, I do have a strict no food policy, uh, again, because of insects and so forth. Uh, of course, it's okay to have water. I've also learned it's a good idea to plan your observatory time in advance. You don't want to just go out there and say, well, what am I going to look at tonight? It's, uh, you can make better use of your time if you can actually uh, plan for that in advance. I've also added a uh, handheld vacuum cleaner. And uh, when you, if you have a, your slots open, uh, insects do come in and fly in and they want to check out what's going on inside there and then they'll attack your monitor. So I just suck them up. <laughs> and uh, sorry, Mr. Insect, but uh, you're a pest. 
Uh, it's a good idea to have a plan for organizing all of your electronic data so you can know where to get it. And it's also a good idea when you're observing team to take electronic notes, since I've got a computer there. Uh, you know, just have a scratch pad open and you can take down and record your notes, record your weather data and so forth. Um, Rod, are, are you, uh, do you still have slides that are coming up? No, I just have this one slide. Of, okay, I just wanted yeah. to make sure with you. Yeah. I'm sorry. No, that's fine. Uh, I took a, um, a miner's headlamp and I removed the white uh, LEDs from it and put in some red ones. And I've got, I've got several of those. So if I have visitors over, uh, we can all wear headlamps, uh, you know, so we don't bump into each other and so forth. Uh, I also found out as a result of COVID, uh, using a KN95 uh, face mask, it uh, keeps your nose from freezing at night. Uh, still occasionally need some insect repellent on your hands, uh, but it usually you don't have to use much. It's a good idea to keep some latex gloves handy in case you need to touch your optics. And of course, an optical cleaning kit if you need it. I uh, discovered that Windows 10 has a nightlight function. So, uh, you know, you can make your uh, monitor, you know, kind of turn red. Uh, I've got a wireless uh, phone. It's uh, every now and then the wife wants to call out there and check on me, make sure I'm still okay. Uh, Having a computer out there is nice. You can have use Spotify for music. And then uh, digital storage is, is done offline on a, on a NAS system. Uh, it's important to really take your time to calibrate and learn what your, what your equipment can do. Uh, so that way, when you run into problems, you kind of have an idea of you know, how, to, how to fix it. Uh, discovered that if you're gonna capture flats and darks, it's important to use the same software that you're gonna use for capturing your lights. And the reason behind that is some software might do just little funny things to, your, to how they handle the data. So if you're using the same piece of software for capturing lights, flats, darks, and so forth, uh, at least you'll have some consistency in your, uh, in your data. Todd, we have another question for you real yes. quick. Okay. Actually, two. Um, from Timothy Weaver, Weaver, the first one is, what about an interior heater? And the second one is, why did you decide on the dome top and not the complete fabricated observatory? Okay, uh, first question. Uh, I originally started with a little, uh, little heater uh, at the floor, a little 1,000 ceramic watt, uh, ceramic type heater. And that worked okay for keeping the toes a little bit warm. Uh, but this winter, I added the, uh, the vest jacket with the 12 volt. And I found out if I really kept my core warm, my extremities would uh, stay warmer. And I really don't need that, uh, that floor heater. So yes, I do have a heater. And, uh, uh, but I'm using the, the vest. So I'll put the vest on. And then I'll put a, a jacket over that to, uh, to keep my core warm. And what was the other question? Um, Timothy's was, why did you decide on the dome top and not the complete fabricated observatory? Um, I guess I don't under, completely understand what is meant by a complete fabricated observatory. You know, at this point, we can pretty much switch over to, uh, you guys could just unmute yourselves at this point if you have questions that about these fine. kind of things. That would be fine. Tim, uh, are you there? Yeah, Tim, are you there? Yeah, I'm there. I'm here. Well, what what did you mean by uh, uh, I, I, I put the link on uh, I I put the link in the uh, chat. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, maybe I can answer that question uh, a little bit later. Uh, the uh, I will say this, Tim, that the dome part is completely fabricated. The, the thing that the Explorer Dome offers is different ways uh, for mounting their dorm. You could, you could build your own uh, building. You could put the dome on top of your roof if you wanted, uh, or you can buy the complete kit where they have the walls, the door, the support structure for the dome and the dome. And that's the way that I chose to go. Uh, so I didn't have to build my own support structure 
for the dome. Uh, I don't know if that answers your question or not, but. Could you, here's another question. Could you control everything, including the dome from inside your house? I, I could if I had uh, the dome uh, control mechanism hooked up to the computer. And I've started working on a, on a project using Adreno to do that. Um, but I haven't finished that project. But yes, I could control completely the whole dome uh, from inside the house if I wanted to. Thank you, Tim. Uh, the next one was up uh, in order was Chuck. Did you? Uh, oh, uh, Chuck. Yeah, just I asked. just had I had to okay. unmute, unmute myself. I was curious about whether you had to meet any local or national codes. I did not. Uh, I live in rural America, and there were no codes that I, I asked the real estate agent that very question when we looked at purchasing the property, uh, what type of codes I had to adhere to, and he said pretty much nothing. So, so good engineering practice. Yes, and then I've had many years experience doing that very thing. Um, so, you know, I did the best that I that I knew to do. Okay. I kind of figured as much. Yeah. Let's see, the other thing on, on the calibration frames, uh, I leave all of my calibration frames on calibrated. So when I'm doing pre-processing, I'll let, let that software do all of the calibration. It's just a way to keep I mean, you could calibrate them, but then you have to remember what's calibrated, what's not calibrated. So I just decided to leave everything on calibrated and then calibrate it uh, in, uh, during pre-processing. Uh, one thing, the final thing uh, about astronomy, there's a lot of moving parts and uh, you're gonna have to master each one of them over time, uh, trial and error which kind of leads me to the next slide. Uh, pretty much you try something and more often than not, it may fail, but eventually you'll find out what is what works success. And those are lessons learned. And that's how you improve your, your skills is, uh, is often by trial and error, or you can learn from others. So I've uh, got the observatory built. Uh, I am now close to retirement. So it was uh, March, 2017. Uh, it was time for me to say goodbye and submit my official notice to my employer, which uh, I kind of decided to take a little different approach. I uh, basically sent him a poem. My time has come to let you know my days are few before I go. Into the sunset, I must begin new life awaits me just around the bend. The week that ends on April 1st is my last day to work on Earth. And so it is with these final words. I submit this notice. Godspeed. God bless. And uh, that's the way I submitted my resignation. The next day, we moved to uh, Miller's Ferry. And uh, we love astronomy out here. So that was uh, in uh, April 1st of 2017. And uh, that fall... I went to Kitt Peak and uh, took their course on intermediate astrophotography, uh, which is basically uh, teaching you how to, uh, to use PixInsight. And that's it, I think. Let me see if this looks good. We had uh, another question um, from Eric. Yes. He asked, uh, how did you isolate your peer from the floor? Uh, yes, when I built the raised floor, uh, there's a, I suppose, probably a half an inch going around the pier that the floor is isolated from. So uh, the entire building structure is isolated from the pier. From so, uh, yeah, I can I'm move sorry, on. I'm sorry, Rod, you, you cut out there. Um, okay. Can you say that again? Yes. The, uh, the floor, the raised floor is isolated from the, the vertical column of the pier by about a half an inch gap that goes all the way around the, uh, the diameter of the raised uh, pier. Uh, that way the floor is attached completely to the building and to the, uh, the concrete floor. Uh, and so the actual vertical 
pier column is completely isolated uh, from the floor and from movement on the floor. I've had as many as I'd say six people in the observatory at one time. Um, the floor is extremely solid and, um, you know, you just move around to, to see things. Oh, Eric's got a question that I want to know. Uh, are you going to remote your observatory so we can use it? <laughs> no. <laughs> we can good try. Question. We it's tried. A good, though. It's a good we tried. question. Yeah, it's, it's okay to ask, right? Yeah. So anyway, we welcome visitors. Uh, you you all can come down sometime if you like. Um, I did build a website. Uh, of course, we call it Sand Island Observatory. And uh, I, I really enjoy doing astronomy. And I uh, thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to share my experience and to share my observatory with you. Well, Rod, that was absolutely fantastic. I love that. So did anybody have any more questions uh, for Rod before we wrap it up. Everyone's telling you how, how great you did. Oh, well, thank you. Thank in you. In the everybody. chat. Thank you. If I had to do it all over again, I would. Well, that's always a good sign. Yeah. Well, at this point, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.